Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome once again to the Meat and Potato Show, conservative talk and awesome rock. I am your host, Christopher Mader, proving once again that the Meat and Potato Show is nationwide, calling all the way from Oregon, former senatorial candidate uh, in Oregon, Mark Callahan. Mark, welcome to the show. How are you, Mark? So, Mark, what happened? What went down last week with everything going on? Why don't you tell us about it? Well, um, I, I came in on the, at the, on the election. Um, got about 18,000 votes, roughly. And uh, unfortunately, the, uh, um, the two supposed front runners, I guess, that were promoted by the media, um, we were going in the liberal media in the area. Just, uh, I mean, I came in first and second. Monica Be- uh, Webby uh, ended up finishing first, and she's moving on to the primary. That's or not the primary, but the general election in November against uh, Jeff Merkley. Right, right. So, um, yeah, I, I, I didn't make it through the primary, and uh, I guess uh, on to bigger and better things, I guess, you know. So, so, so are you gonna, you're going to, um, are you going to support her in her campaign? You're going to at least be active in her campaign? What's going on there? Well, I, I contacted her campaign manager, and uh, his name is Charlie, and uh, he, he uh, contacted me back. He said that uh, right now they're going to kind of run, kind of lean in terms of uh, not ramping up quite yet uh, in order to save some money, I guess. Mm-hmm. But uh, they, I, I, so I, I'd like to go to work for a campaign, maybe hers, and I've been in contact with a couple other campaigns, too, to try to go to work for them. Other than that, I've been uh, looking for work. Uh, do the campaign versus uh, uh, working, I guess, in you know, IT consulting. So I'm, I'm looking for work right now. I'd, I'd like to do something else. Uh, I'll just remind you that I'll try to find out an IT or I'd like to, I can build a pretty good radio voice. So I'll be just doing some There you go. There you go. It's just, there's a potential for you right there. <laughs> no, really. Yeah. You do. Um. So, yeah, I didn't realize, you, yeah, you're technically, well, I'm not going to say you're not working. Like I said, you do consulting work, but, um, yeah, everybody's always looking for the next job to, um, to, to try to, you know, put bread on the table, that kind of thing. Um, how was, how's money looking, though, for the Republican side? Like, you had just mentioned that she, uh, you know, that, 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 and it is a woman that, that's, that, that won the primary, correct? Right? Am I got that right? Am I got my notes right here? Yeah, I mean, Oregon, Oregon kind of has a reputation for being kind of a blue state. Uh, and the state of pretty state, it's more like the major cities that are controlling the politics here in Oregon, uh, kind of the Blue Islands is what I refer to them as. Wow. But, uh, I mean, it, there's, I mean, the Democrats definitely have a machine in place. I mean, they have the unions and they have the uh, their, their own uh, liberal leftist progressive people that fund the campaigns and stuff. And uh, Jeff Berkeley definitely needs to be removed from office because he's not what this country is about, and he doesn't represent me as my senator anyway. But, uh, I mean, that's one of the reasons actually why I ran is because we need to remove Jeff Berkeley from office. Right. So, Has he been around? Has he been around in the state at all? Have, have you seen him, you know, doing anything as far as campaigning is concerned? Well, in, in terms of Jeff campaigning? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah right, or, right. You know, well, um, I know he did some town halls earlier in the year, and so I, I did I did see him at a couple of the town halls earlier in the year. I actually friends with him at both of the town halls on some questions like to do with small arms treaty and term limits. But uh, I mean, I haven't really haven't really seen him campaigning much. But I mean, basically, uh, he's gonna he's gonna get his Democrats and his his communists and his socialists and his uh, progressives to vote for him and fund his campaign, and then. The only other option is Monica, uh, who was, as, as you know, the same race I was in, uh, that made it through the primary so as a Republican candidate. Yeah, that's the thing. See, we, as I've, as I've been working on some of the campaigns here in Massachusetts, too, and I'm, I'm very much involved with the Tea Party that's around here, so I actually get to rub shoulders with a lot of the candidates. And, of course, I do this show, and I rub shoulders with the candidates. Um... The incumbents, though, very rarely, very rarely have I seen them. Uh, I have very, I don't think I've ever met either of them. We have a guy, his, his name's Charlie Baker. He's running for governor here in Massachusetts. 
I've met him a couple of times and asked him both times, uh, you know, extended an invitation to come on the show. Nothing. Absolutely zero response from him. Um, <clears throat> but as far as even the Democrat side, zero. You know, nobody, nobody from the incumbent side. I do put out the invitations. I don't hear anything. I just did an interview a couple of weeks ago with Keisha Rogers. Uh, she's a Lewis Democrat that's running out in Texas. I gotta get hold of her again and find out how she did in her primary. I haven't even looked up the news or anything about that yet. But she's the only one. She's like the only one on the Democrat side that's ever come on the show. And people used to give me crap about it, even when I was on WCUW. They used to say to me, why are you talking to these crazy crackpot Democrats? I says, I got news for you. <laughs> they're the only Democrats that answer my phone calls. That's why they're coming on to the show. So this is what I mean about somebody like Merkley. It's like, yeah, you you know, you saw him at a couple of town hall rallies. This is this is the same thing that's going to be going on here in Massachusetts. Um, our, our governor, well, he's not running, but let's say he was running again. You wouldn't see him. You know, he'd be locked away up in, up in Boston, up in Beacon Hill. You'd never see him out. You you might see him once in a great while on a newscast or something like that. But then, boom, sure enough, he's going to win the election. And and that's the same machine that they've got going over there in Oregon, don't they? Well, yeah, I mean, there's, there's kind of an air of elitism, basically. I mean, yeah. once, they, once they get elected, they, they feel like they're no longer accountable, no longer responsible to actually being responsive to those that they're supposed to represent. that are going on in Oregon. What are some of what were some of the main points that you heard from some of the people that you talked to and the events you went to? And just the stuff that you know just from living there. What are the key issues that people are concerned about in Oregon, concerning Oregon? I know we're always concerned about the national stuff, jobs and security and all that other stuff. I'm talking about what what's going on in your state that people are concerned about. Well a lot of people are concerned about the Thank you. 
then it doesn't sound like, yeah. What was Oracle doing specific? What were they making specifically for the state of Oregon? What was that specific? Do you know about that? I think it was a cover Oregon website, and uh, basically that failed. And so, oh, is this I mean, part of the uh, Obamacare mandate? Is that the Obamacare? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Uh, yeah, the cover of Oregon boons off of basically the Oregon version of Obamacare. Right. So, um, basically, I mean, as, as you may be aware, the federal government gave two choices. One, they accept the federal exchange, or two, uh, states could develop their own exchange. Well, I guess Oregon decided to develop their own exchange, but the thing is, the kicker is that there's a Senate Bill 99 here in Oregon that went through the Oregon legislature that basically stated that the Oregon exchange will be aligned with the federal exchange, or has to be able to trying to get the information on that. We, that is insane. It, jobs, yeah, I want to get back to the timber thing, though. I mean, I even remember back during Clinton, the whole spotted owl damn debate that was going on. And I mean, you know, I, I hey, look, I'm, I'm, you and I are the, as environmental as the next guy. But I mean, when it comes to, you know, putting food on the table, and I mean, you see these crazy TV shows that are on, tell, you know, you know, what is it, Axeman and Northwest Loggers and all that stuff. And, and I think to myself, what's the real story here? What's going on? I mean, is this just a television show? Is, what is going on here? And I mean, where are these so-called, you know, logging and timber jobs that are, that are big up in, the, up in the Northwest? And from what you're telling me, it sounds like uh, they're pretty much drying up out there. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's the environmentalists out here that are basically controlling things. Yeah, and hey. you know, reality TV has, a, has basically a reputation for not being, actually being reality. So, I mean, it's all dramatized and fictionalized. Sure. But the point is, there's a lot of upset people out here that lost their jobs in local economies and local counties out here that don't have the timber dollars coming in, and they're basically having to depend, depend upon uh, federal welfare in terms of uh, welfare payments, basically you know, equate to welfare payments as the federal government is paying these counties not a law, not to cut timber. And I mean, you have like a couple of forest plans out here. You have the Wyden forest plan. You have a couple other forest plans that that just aren't going to work because basically it still locks up millions of millions of feet of uh, board feet sure. in terms of timber that can't be cut. Yeah, and I mean, you end up with these towns that are just, there must be some, like, pretty serious ghost towns. You just said that. I mean, it's affecting police forces. I mean, they can't even fund, they probably can't even fund fire departments and schools and everything else. I'm sure some of the towns are, I know, it, I remember back in the 70s, here in Massachusetts, towns merged. You know, if one town was really, you know, in a, in a financial pickle, what they would do is they would merge with the town next door and the kids would go to the schools over there. Uh, have you seen things like that? Have you seen towns just basically declaring bankruptcy or merging? How how bad uh, is it on the street level out there? Not so much. I mean, I've just, uh, just been talking to people when I was going to the candidate forums and other campaign events when I was running the campaign. And, uh, I mean, as I talk to people and I drive through towns, I mean, I see their economies are depressed. You know, I, I see that, I mean, there's not that many jobs in these little small towns anymore because of the timberland and sure. because of the environmentalists are locking everything up in port. And here's the thing. They don't manage, you know, the federal has 90%. There's an interesting little study I've been doing, I've been doing on the side about, uh, and it started when I heard about the Bundy Ranch and, the, and started getting into learning about the BLM. You know, that when it comes to federal lands and once they lock up the land, I mean, it's like they put a, it's like they put a, a, a locked door on the entrance to these national forests and, and nobody's allowed in there. So what you end up having is you end up having millions of acres that aren't managed, 
that aren't watched over, nothing's being done with them or to them, either positively or even in some cases maybe negatively, maybe cutting down some of the trees, maybe building a road, but at least if man's presence is in there, they can go in and they can say, you know what, there's a lot of dead wood in here. We gotta get up here, we gotta clear it all out. Or there was a fire up here last year, we ought to get up here and clear out all the dead wood that's in there or we're gonna have another fire. That's not happening with these federally protected lands. So what's happening is now you are, you're having these wildfires that just take over and burn hundreds of thousands of acres because there's nobody there managing it. At least if you have an area there where you're doing timber cutting, you know, one side of the mountain might have lots of timber, but then the other side of the mountain's kind of cleared out a little bit, and then there's other acreage where there's what they call fire breaks. You have these cleared areas where they logged last year, and now there's new growth growing in there, but it's a fire break. If there's a fire, it's going to hit this area where there's really nothing, and the fire's going to burn out because of that management. Uh, what, how's the summer going to look out there? I mean, are you, are you guys prepared for fires? I mean, is that a concern that you hear out there? Oh, yeah, it's very concerning. I mean, we, we have wildfires every summer because, as you, as you stated, I mean, we can't get in there, we can't harvest the land, we can't cut down the timber. And what, what these environmentalists don't, don't realize is that when you cut down the timber, the timber companies replant. The key word is replant. They have to. You they know? would want to. Well, who would want to clear everything out and then say, all right, see you later? I mean, that's not a very good business model. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I mean, in, in order to have a, uh, what, what they refer to as sustainability, I guess, but uh, sustainability is one of those green keywords, you know, I don't yeah. probably, I don't use it myself, but the point is, in order to have a business in the future, you have to continue to re-up your, your resources, and if you, you have to replant the trees and after you harvest them in order to continue to have resources to be able to harvest in the future. There's already, and, and I mean, think about uh, between Oregon and Washington State itself, I mean, there's millions of acres that's already federally protected, national parks, national forests. I mean, and we're not, and, and these towns that are in there, you know, that where the logging companies are, I mean, we're not, I mean, do you have any large companies there? Like, I forget what some of the names are. You know, some of the big paper mill companies that produce all the paper, or, you know, or all the lumber companies that, that produce, like Warehouser, there's a, there's a company I'm thinking of. I used to be a contractor, I used to be a contractor years ago. You'd think I'd remember all these names, but it's been years since I've done it, so I, I don't remember the names. But what I'm saying is, is it's not like you have these huge conglomerates going in there and just wiping out hundreds of thousands of acres and then moving on. A lot of these logging companies, they're small family-owned companies, aren't they? Exactly, exactly. I mean, you do have like the bigger ones, like a national paper and warehouse right. or stuff like that, but I mean, you have these small communities that are owned by these small mom and pop um, shops or organizations that are basically being shut down because the environmentalists out here are walking up the land. The federal government is yeah. walking up the land as a result of these courts. <clears throat> The, the Bundy thing, I, and I, again, I didn't know this until I, until it started hitting the news. There was something like, I think there were 58, 57 or 58 major ranchers in Nevada. Now Bundy's like the last one. And I mean, they're doing the same thing with the logging up in the Northwest. There must have been at some point in time, I'm just going to throw a number out there, probably a couple hundred of individual family logging companies, generations father, son, grandfather, all the way down, they've been logging up in the mountains. That's all gone now. It's, it's unbelievable. Where do you see, where do you see, I mean, wh what are these people going to do? What are these, what's, wh and where are we going to get our lumber from? I mean, what the hell? What the hell's, what, what are these people thinking? Uh, I, I mean, I don't know. It's Oregon's really struggling. And then on top of all that, we have, we're one of the, oh, one of the highest states in the union that has the highest taxes. And so basically we're overtaxed up here. We got no our economy's failing because we got we got a bunch of jobs that are, are leaving the state because Oregon is Timberland. You know, that's what our economies are based on. Not that our, our economy should not be based on getting a subsidy from the federal government not to cut the land. Right. I mean the point is we need to get out there and of course we need to get out there and take our be cutting those trees, take our sovereignty back. I think a lot of this has to do with agenda twenty one. Very interesting that you say that, that because well, the last part.
parts of one of the of uh, my blog and the last bit, part of the expose that I put out. <clears throat> it's almost like you know, the more you research, you, you come to these epiphanies. You see things going on, and you and a light goes off in your head. You you just hit the nail on the head. You've got more and more people not working out there. You got more and more people on government uh, subsidies, while at the same time, you're being taxed to death. This is where this is where I said in my blog the personification of evil. They know this. The government knows this. The federal government, the state governments, they all know this. Rather than have a thriving economy, businesses, jobs, uh, a rise in the standard of living, which creates an incredible tax base, more businesses, more jobs, more money, more taxes. It's simple economics 101. What they have here now is they have this huge well of unemployed or low-income workers. They're in the millions. Now, maybe not in the millions per se out in Oregon, but what I'm saying is their numbers are large enough to where somebody in government, and this is what I mean by the personification of evil, these people are evil. Somebody somewhere scratched their head and said, you know, you know, we can tax this. We can tax poverty. That's essentially what they're doing. If they create more poverty, they can tax poverty. And here we are, these Democrat liberals are supposed to, well, we're here for the little man. We're, we're here to, to rise you up and, and, and try, to, try to give you that job and pull you out of welfare. No, the whole idea is get more of them. Get more of them on welfare, tax them, and I'm sure you guys probably have a minimum wage thing going on, too. That they're thinking of raising it to $10.10 here in Massachusetts. And all that's going to do is just put the poor into another tax bracket which means they'll be taxed more. And it's, it sounds like the same thing is going on over in Oregon. You just you get more poor people, get them more on welfare, and then tax the crap out of them. Why? Because you've got millions of them now. Exactly, and then you, and then you, get, a culture of, you get a culture of dependency out here, Thank you. of government dependency. And, of course, when people are dependent upon the government, they want to maintain the status quo, and they, they vote for the politicians that are basically going to keep on giving them the Christmas gifts, you know, I hear it. It's like, I mean, a couple of years ago when, when uh, that president of ours was reelected, I mean, basically Rush Limbaugh hit, it on the nail, hit the nail on the head where he said, you know, you can't vote against Santa Claus because the guy was basically promising all this stuff, sure. you know, and I, I've always been a tough person. I, I was raised to basically work for what I get because I value it more. I don't want to be a doubt. And so when, when I, I, I mean, we need to get our work ethic back as a country. Our country is not based and founded upon dependency. Our country is based upon innovation. Our country is based upon American exceptionalism mm -hmm. and working for what we get because we value it more. I, I, and this whole government dependency stuff where, they, where the government's giving handouts and, they don't, and people don't realize where the money is coming yeah. from when it's yeah. coming from the taxpayers that are being taxed to death. You know, we, we got to stop this. we got to get our country back here. How does your opponent... The that um, that beat you out in the primary. How does? I mean, have you mentioned some of this stuff to her? How, has she has she voiced her concerns around these types of ideas, or or do you see the the standard political canned responses coming from her? Well, I mean, she was uh, she, the, the Monica made it through the primary. Basically, she she was kind of recruited and, and uh, manufactured by the national establishment. I mean. Uh, it, I mean, she she has her talking points, and I mean, she has her little notes that she carried with her. I've seen her at a candidate forum that's carried with her. But I mean, um, she she was recruited by the national establishment. She had a lot of, a lot of national establishment people behind her. And I I was more I'm more conservative in the, in the fact that I was I was more doing grassroots here in Oregon. I mean, I had uh, a a, a bump with a uh, blah blah blah. blah. She had the money and she had the backing. Um, I I can't remember. Was she there at that that when you were doing the Willamette Week thing? Was she there? Was she? I can't yeah, remember. She was, she was in the room. I mean, uh, she was on my right hand side, and then uh, she was the one that patted her. you on the shoulder. I remember watching the video, and she was she the one patting you on the shoulder when you got up and left. Yeah, she kind of put her hand on my shoulder like, when when uh, they basically kicked me out. Yeah. So yeah. Really? Now, did you? 
I know you probably. I, I've seen a lot. I saw your stuff on Fox News, and, I, and I've seen some of the other uh, clips that you posted. But a question that I've wanted to ask you: Did you have a feeling going into that that something was not right, or did you have a feeling that okay, I know that this is going to be a very left-leaning type of news uh, interview? Did you kind of have a sixth sense about that? Uh, how did you feel about that? Oh, it, was, it was kind of a hunch. I mean, I, 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 I'm the type of person I, I keep an open mind, you know. Uh, but I, I knew that the Week uh, was kind of a liberal, left-leaning newspaper. But, I mean, earlier in the interview, that, I mean, that's kind of when my hunch was confirmed in the fact that they only start, they were only asking questions of their uh, two supposed front-runners, Jason and Monica. I mean, honestly, I didn't think there was a front runner myself because I was a candidate for base two. But the point is, I noticed them earlier in the interview, uh, prior to the, the two minutes that, uh, that went viral, uh, earlier in the interview, they were only asking questions of Jason and Monica. So Tim, uh, the guy in the end, another candidate, and I basically spoke up. He said, well, he asked whether he even needs to be there. And then I spoke up and I said, you know, what is this, the Jason and Monica show? And then so, so they, they, they started asking questions of the other people. And then I uh, got to the point in the interview where uh, that, that two minute viral video that you saw, I mean, uh, where they were disrespecting uh, a candidate that was on the speaker phone. Right. So. Jesus. And they got, and I'll tell you, they got away with it. I, I'm wondering, yeah. though, how, <clears throat> what was some of the fallout for Willamette, though? I mean, was, did, I mean, people, did people boycott them, protest, write in? What, did you hear anything about that? Because I was actually looking for that. I went onto their site, you know, and of course it's just their business website and everything. I couldn't find anything about any fallout uh, against them for what they did. Did you hear anything? Yeah, well, they, they attempted to put, like, their defense on there, and I think they got, like, 2,700 comments or something like that, basically all of them were against them, because it, basically the people that were comments commenting on their website uh, were basically saying how much of a bulkhead move it was for their, for their reporters to be disrespectful to the, to the five of us there. And so all the 20, most of the 2,700 majority, actually, the 2,700 comments from their, their supposed rebuttal of what happened uh, were against what they were saying because basically they were saying that why we screwed up, you know, so. Sure, sure. Well, I guess when you're a Pulitzer Prize writer, you get to do whatever the hell you want at that point in time. Yeah, <laughs> Mark, I want to thank you for calling in. Thanks a lot for uh, coming back onto the show. We've got to keep in touch with you and keep up on this thing that's uh, going on in Oregon. Send my name if you can to head to your uh, to your uh, your challenger there that was that uh, beat you out in the primary, and um, hopefully she'll respond and get hold of me. But uh, as I told you before, you know it's uh, usually once they get into that phase, they don't have time for small little shows like mine and I, I before before we go i you know i want to thank you for coming on to my show all the times that you did <clears throat> one of the things you know, i'm going to pat my own back and toot my own horn here um i do the show the way i do it and meet people like you um and i'm going to say it because it's basically true it's been a true thing throughout the since 2008 ever since i started the show is I want to interview candidates like you and get to know people like you and listen to people like you because quite literally, in a lot of cases, you guys really have a snowball's chance in hell of, of winning the election. And, I, and it's because of people like the Willamette Weekly. I mean, you just said it yourself. You know, it's gonna, it, they're just talking to the two front-running candidates that are in there and you guys are there. You've got a lot of great ideas and you've got a voice and you matter. And this is why I reach out to people like you and I want you on my show and why I try to work as hard as I can to make it as viral as possible, send it all across the internet and get as many people to watch it as possible. Because you'll never ever get heard. You'll never get heard. You'll never be seen on the national news except for what happened to you on and Fox News. But even that, that's just a flash in the pan thing. Whereas with my show, is you'll come on, I'll, I'll have you on again. You, you know, now, now we know each other. Now I'm going to, you know what? There's something going on in Oregon. I think I'm going to get hold of Mark, and I'll have him come on the show next week just to see what he knows about this thing that just popped up in the news last week. That See, now now I know you, and, and when you go to run for Congress again or maybe run for Senate again, or even if you run for something local in your area, 
you know what? I'm going to call that Mater guy over there in Massachusetts and get on his show because he, and, and do that. Please do that. But that's why I do it. It's because I want to know people like you, and I want the rest of the nation to know people like you. And I just want to say thank you so much, Mark, for taking the time out and coming on to my show. Well, thank, thank you, Chris. I, I, really, I really do enjoy coming on your show. And, um, I know we've had some scheduling uh, conflicts here recently, but I mean, yes. the point is, I, I, I really enjoy being on your show because, I mean, that, I, I, I have a message, and I, I still have the message, even though I didn't make it through the primary. But I still have the same drive. I still have the same motivation. I still have the same passion sure. to get our country back on the right track. And uh, there, there is a place for me. I, I believe fully believe that God has a plan for me. And I'm going to get in there, and I'm going to, I'm going to get our time to help get our country back on the right track. And if, if one of the things I can do is come on your show to help spread that message, so be it. But yeah, I, I really am very appreciative, Chris, about and, uh, uh, you, you allowing me to be on your show. You've so. been, you've been bitten by that political bug now. You've, you've never done this before, have you? You never ran for anything before, did you? Well, I, I ran for a couple of local things, a state rep a couple of times, right. school board and county commission, but uh, I mean nothing, nothing on a national level like the like the U.S. Senate race I was just recently in. So, but you've got the bug now. You've got the bug. And no, I think you're right. Um, the blog again in in the blog feed. You know, there's there's two types of people, uh, and you're not you're not in that personification of evil column. You know, there's two types of people. There's people that do it because they feel it in their heart. They they. Like you just said, you believe that God has a plan for you, and this is something that you need to follow. And by all means, please follow it, because if that's the plan, that's, you know, the, everything will sort itself out in the end, and God will let you know, you know, when he's ready to show you his plan. And other people do it because they just, you know, you know, I feel like I've got to do something and contribute to my community, and I can't stand watching what's going on anymore. They're, they're on the other column. So it's very good to know that somebody like you is out there. And yeah, we're going to have you back on again. And uh, thank you so much. Mark Callahan, thank you so much for calling into the show. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate it. Have a great day. All right. We'll talk to you soon, brother. See you. Bye. Bye. That is too bad. It's too bad that he didn't make it in. <clears throat> you know, I thought, I really, really thought that when that thing blew up uh, with the Willamette Weekly, and uh, he started sh showing up on Fox News, and I, I was like, wow, this is going to be really good. And it was the first time, i got to tell you something, this is the first time in the, meat, in the history of the Meat and Potato Show that uh, a candidate like that, somebody like that, um, had gotten to national prominence. Now, I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, that's because of me. I'm just saying, you know, that six degrees of separation, it's like it's the first time, and I scratched my head, I was like, oh, wow, this is great. It's like... This is going to go national. This is going to be big. This guy could possibly win. This guy will be on my show. And, I, and there was. It was a little bit of selfishness there. i, I got to admit completely. Um, but that's just how things grow over time. You know, eventually, it's like Mark said, you know, there's a plan out there. There's a plan for him. Um, eventually, he's going to win one of these elections. And he's going to be on my show. And, and that's just because this show's not going anywhere. And God, God help us. God, you know. Because God is, uh, you know, always, always in the driver's seat, so it's up to him. Uh, but we're not going anywhere, and uh, Mark's not going anywhere. And eventually, you're going to see that, and it's going to happen. <clears throat> and uh, at that time, when I saw him on uh, Fox News, I thought maybe, I was like, wow, maybe, maybe now, maybe now we're gonna, you know, he's gonna get picked up. Eventually, I, my show will get picked up, but it wasn't to be. Close though, very close. So we will see what goes on with Mark in the future. Ladies and gentlemen, the Meat and Potato Show, conservative talk, awesome rock, and we'll be back. <laughs>